Soul Source is a podcast made by women for women. We talk with a wide variety of experts, ranging from a sex therapist to the CDC and everywhere in between, to bring you the stories you're only going to hear here. Our goal is to entertain and educate because it's more clear now than ever just how much we as women are doing, as parents, as spouses, employees, just as everything. Don't miss out on being in the know. Subscribe to Soul Source wherever you listen to podcasts today. Leave us a review too because this part's really important. When you leave those reviews, that's how we're able to continue bringing you the content you love each and every week. So buckle up, Soul Source Society, because we're about to get started. Confidence is not something one person can teach another person. I can give you all kinds of things you can do in order to increase your confidence, but that's on you. You build that yourself. Hello, ladies. Welcome to yet another episode of Soul Source with me, your host, Raquel Lamel. Okay, so I have a question for everyone. Who here likes public speaking? I know I hated it at first. It's one of those practice makes perfect sort of things, and it is so uncomfortable, and no one wants to practice it. (laughs) And the thing is, public speaking is useful in so many ways. So, for instance, those same skills that it takes to speak publicly, say in front of a crowd, you know, with a PowerPoint, are the same skills it takes to network in a room and build your business or win that marketing or sales pitch. I mean, the list is endless for why this is a must have skill. You know what's even worse? Women often struggle with this the most. It goes down deep, ladies, into the way we think, the way we carry ourselves, and into the way society trains us. Oh, yeah, we're talking about all of it here with my guest today. Megan Hamilton is the founder of UBU Skills. She's a speaking, visibility, and confidence coach for women. And she's going to help us gain confidence today through things called shadow work, tarot cards, and so much more. Megan, welcome to Soul Source. Thanks, Raquel. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to dig into not just this topic, but the way that you go about helping women because it's so unique. I was looking at your website and I am so interested. (laughs) Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's funny, too, because it's a it's sort of like a hodgepodge of tricks and tips that I've learned and picked up along the way and then sort of personal growth techniques that I was using that I was like, wait a minute this could actually really help my clients. And, um, and yeah, it's evolved into this, into this, uh, entity that it is today. (laughs) Well, it seems to be going well. So I want to start off very, very first question, speaking visibility and confidence coach. That is your title for women and non-binary people. So start off by just telling me what does that mean and why target those groups? Sure. So Speaking visibility and confidence grew out of, I actually used to call myself a public speaking coach and I was working with a coach because I'm almost always working with coaches because as a coach, I understand the value of having coaches. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, public speaking coach has never felt completely right to me. It's something that people recognize and they sort of Mm -hmm. get. But I was also thinking like, I don't know, are people do people search on Google public speaking coach? Do they even know we exist? And so I was trying to figure out like what would feel better to call myself and my coach said, you know, we always talk about niching down, but what about niching up? And I was like, what? And she's like, you do public speaking is one of the things you do with people, but actually you do so much more. And I was like, oh my gosh, of course. And so then I thought about the things that Speaking was going to stay, obviously. Visibility is so much a part of it, and it's especially important for women and uh, historically oppressed communities. And the confidence piece is something, you know, that has always been really important to me, but it's it's also a talking point because I can't teach anybody confidence. Nobody can. Confidence is not something one person can teach another person. I can give you all kinds of things you can do in order to increase your confidence, but that's on you. You build that yourself, right? And that involves you like going into fearful situations. And I don't mean like physically in danger, but you know, stretching outside of your comfort zone and continuing to work on yourself and to keep going so you see results. And that is how you build confidence. It's, it's, it's just trying basically. And, you know, specifically to women and non-binary people, when I started doing this work, I was working with students in a law school and I was helping coach them through um, something called a moot court program where they pretend to be lawyers. And that evolved into taking on clients 
one-on-one. And the more I started working with women and non-binary people, and by that I'm sort of, you know, it's not that I don't work with men because I do. It's just that I am interested in working with groups of folks who like have had to work hard to see themselves represented. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they don't have the same, you know, we all have sort of people that we look up to, that we aspire to be, that, Mm -hmm. you know, excite something inside of us in order to, to keep working up towards something. And when you don't see yourself represented in media, in stories, in movies, in, uh, you know, all of the things that we consume, it's hard for you to even sort of imagine yourself in, in that place that you want, want to be. And so when I started working with folks who didn't have the same models, I started to realize that there's a whole other group of learning that had to happen. There was so much internal work that had to happen, right? And that, and that was not something I had done a lot of work on with folks up until that point. And that's how I started bringing shadow work into, into the mix as well, because so much of what was staffing people was internal, which had nothing to do with the outside world. And that's, that's where we had to get started with. That's so interesting. So tell me shadow work is a new term for me personally, and I don't know if anybody else, it might be new for some of our listeners, just in a nutshell, what is that? Yeah. I can tell you that it's very popular right now because that is the number one source of Google search for people finding my website. It's been the last four months and I'm like, really? But there you go. So shadow work uh, was developed and coined by Carl Jung back in, you know, the turn of the, of the century, the previous century. And it is essentially taking a look at the parts of your psyche that we generally avoid, right? So bad behavior of the past, um, behaviors that we do now that we sort of refuse to see the truth behind, um, things that have happened to us that were difficult, uh, anything that sort of lives outside of our consciousness that we either are aware of or unaware of that ends up sort of running the boat by using fear. And so when you're, when you don't acknowledge these pieces of yourself that are icky, that are uncomfortable, that are, that you haven't, you know, taken the time to really take a look at that stuff, you know, according to Carl Jung is running around and is creating a lot of the fear. We're fearful that people will find out the truth about us, right? That is a huge, a huge piece of, um, um, like imposter syndrome. Yes. Thank you. So yeah, imposter syndrome is a huge piece of that, right? The idea that people are going to find out the truth about you, that there's there's something inherently wrong with you, that, that you've managed to dupe everybody. So those are the things that we take a look at. And we, um, you know, with one client, for example, she had a massive fear of public speaking and she had to do it on the regular and she'd have to take beta blockers every single time Ooh. because she would just get so freaked out. So we talked about that and it turns out an ex-boyfriend of hers, who was, you know, pretty crappy, uh, would often comment on her voice in a really disparaging way. And so she had that voice of that dude from, you know, I think it was high school or early university, telling her that she wasn't good at this and creating the situation. And so once we sort of really took a look at that and she allowed herself to you know, feel feelings, to acknowledge that that happened, to really take a look at what she was thinking about. She was able to move on from that in a, in a substantive way and not sort of have this, you know, this part of herself that she wasn't really acknowledging that was also stopping her from being able to talk in front of a group of people without, you know, taking drugs to manage it. That is crazy. Like something just as simple as like an old ex-boyfriend can be so like manifesting so much. Yes. And I mean, I bet, you know, your listeners, if you take a second to just stop and think about it, who, what voice do you have inside of your head? That's just like, you suck or you're not good at this. Cause I can tell you too, as soon as she mentioned that, I realized that so much of the um, blocks that I get, I'm a songwriter as well. 
when I get that, I have this ex-boyfriend and we would have this conversation. We had this conversation one day where I was like, oh, well, I really like this new song. You know, I think it, it sort of um, like reminds me of Neil Young or something like that. And we got talking about Neil Young and, you know, I ha there's a chord on the, my guitar that I have a hard time playing. And, and, uh, and I was like, well, you know, people make mistakes or they're not perfect or whatever. I'm like, Neil Young's not perfect. And he's like, what do you think you're, what do you think you're on par with Neil Young? And I was like, yeah, don't you? <laughs> Oh no. Right? <laughs> and then and then I was like, oh, oh. And then I just every time now I hear him going, What do you think you're on par with Neil Young? And like I've, you know, I've worked through this now, but I realized in the moment, oh, like this actually impacts me on the regular. This offhand thing that this, you know, sort of crappy ex boyfriend said to me. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us, um, a lot of us have uh, similar stories that we could probably fish out pretty easily. So public speaking, it's one of, of the, the biggest fears for people. Some even say that they fear it more than death, whether it's an ex-boyfriend telling you you suck or any other number of reasons. Why do you think that it's just such a common fear for people? Well, you know, as a society, we are uh, worried about being judged. Right. And that that is a huge thing, specifically for women and um, non-binary people or traditionally historically oppressed people. We've been it's been weaponized against us. So for, like from the very beginning in terms of the forum. So that was like early sort of Greek and Roman times when they would get people up to talk about things. Right. Philosophy was such a big part of of um, how they organized their society. And so folks would get up in the middle of the square and you know, philosophize or orate. And that was like a really big thing that, that everybody was into. And so if you were a good orator, you would be seen as somebody who, who placed really high in society. But women were not allowed on the forum. And not only that, there's like, you know, this is in Mary Beard's book, Women in Power, which is, I quote it all the time because it's so amazing. From like early you know, um, carving. So like the earliest sort of recordings of, of that particular time, women's voices are called shrill. Uh, women are said to be not smart enough to get up and, uh, and per perform in the forums. Um, our brains aren't as, um, accustomed or, or to, to rational thinking and, um, you know, essentially being clever. And so like that is, <laughs> Right? Like that's written down. It was important enough that they wrote it down and it wasn't easy to, you know, record things back then. So we're fighting that. That's not, that's like tangible. That is easy to follow the lines. And yes, it's 2000 years later. And yet, yes, here we still are. And you talk to almost any woman who's had to sort of walk into a room full of men and give any kind of presentation. More often than not, they have all had the same experience of, oh, I'm getting such a weird vibe right now. What's going on? And then the first thing that women do is say, it must be me. It must be in my head. I'm imagining this, right? Mm -hmm. That vibe right. that you get sometimes. And I'm here to say, you're not imagining it. It's 100% there, whether or not the people who are giving you the vibe even know about it. Because so much of our misogyny is internalized and it, you know people you'd ask somebody like oh are you a misogynist and they would say oh my gosh no I love women but at the same time so many internal biases come up that they don't even realize and so my thing is what you're feeling is accurate your intuition is correct but you're not going to fight hundreds and thousands of years of patriarchy in this particular moment what you can do is be awesome and leave it at that. Like that's all we can do, right? We can't be like, hey guys, <laughs> why do I feel so weird in this room with all of you? What's <laughs> going on in your minds? What vibes are you sending to me? That's just not, it's just not gonna happen. And, you know, I think sort of globally, we need to start rethinking about what we think leadership is. And, and, um, and I think a lot of that's changing as well, but as a society, we still don't really 
equate men and women the same in terms of of leadership ability. Uh, there's another article I just read recently. I was asked to write um, a piece for a, a, an organization called Fairy God Boss, which is, do you know Fairy God Boss? It's like a big group of, uh, it's a membership for women who are looking for jobs, but there's lots and lots of experts on there who talk about different things and help help people um, figuring out figure out how to get into the workforce and so she sent me the woman who asks me to write stuff there sent me this piece that was basically monitoring people's responses to voices that they heard okay and men with low resonant voices always placed high in terms of whether or not people thought they would be a good leader. And in fact, then they went ahead and did even further research, which was to measure the, um, the salaries of CEOs who, and, and the, and the, uh, their Is voices. it based on voice? Yeah. Oh, or wow. The, um, people with deeper voices get paid. Like, I think it's like 13 to 18% more. Now don't quote me on that quote because I'm, you know, as I've always, I've already indicated that my recall is terrible, but it's like, it's substantial. And so we are ingrained to think, right, that this person is going to be a better leader because of X qualities of their voice. Oh, my gosh. That's like that's something I would, you would never even think that. So women, you know, you said you have to help women then like focus inward. So how what are some of the ways? What are some of the things you do that help women be able to enter that room, have that confidence, even though they're getting the vibes that are completely accurate that people think they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, the shadow work, I, I developed a, uh, it's a free workbook. Uh, it's, it's like an introduction to shadow work and it sort of goes over my philosophy behind it and how I practice it. And I build compassion into the process. And that's actually what you're doing through shadow work is building compassion for yourself, which extends to compassion for other people. So what, what, you know, one of the biggest clues as to what we should probably be working on is what drives you crazy about other people? What behaviors when you see other people exhibiting those behaviors makes you just like get furious or sort of like really, really upset internally quite often those are the same behaviors that we exhibit that we don't like about ourselves whether we're aware of it or not so next time you find yourself getting like really frustrated just be like wait a minute do i do this <laughs> and you may not even realize it so that's one of the first clues but the reason we dive into shadow work is a to like to really go back so it's a lot of peeling back the later layers through journaling. It's questions like, what is the first memory you have of somebody commenting on your voice? How did that make you feel? And then why did it make you feel that way? And then trying to, to go back and, and then see other situations in our sort of more adult life of where we've exhibited some similar behaviors and realize, oh, this goes back to here. Oh, I'm just protecting myself from getting hurt. And when we can find, we can be like, oh, it's not that I'm a bad person. It's, you know, this thing that I do to manipulate other people. It's not that I'm a bad person. It is that X amount of years ago, I was hurt. And I'm now, my brain is trying to protect me from being hurt again. And that's why I'm exhibiting this behavior. And like 90 to 95% of the time, this is how it unfolds when we do shadow work. And then there's, you know, the... Um, I have a reintegration exercise that I learned from uh, from somebody else that I talks about how to bring that person who was hurt back sort of into the present so they can exist with you and you just have a deeper and richer understanding of yourself so that when you walk into a room, you aren't afraid of people finding out the truth about you because you're really clear about who you are now instead of you know you also hiding from those pieces of yourself that are difficult to take a look at right most of us aren't going to be like all right i've got an hour i'm going to sit down i'm going to bust out my journal and i'm going to write down crappy things about myself <laughs> it doesn't sound fun at all megan no <laughs> it's not but 
That's why I always include the compassion piece and the reintegration piece because it allows you to come full circle and not leave you in that sort of dark place of really taking a look at the parts of yourself that are that are icky. And then, you know, once you sort of do that for a while, it's not it's not every day. It's just, you know, you have moments where you think I I don't like how that went down why did I do this? Or why did I make this choice? And then you sort of, you know, you'll find something new about yourself and something, something new to take a look at. But it's not, you know, it's not about um, self-flagellation or sort of like, you know, getting yourself into, uh, into it's sort of a dark space. It's really about learning who you are, truthfully, who you are, not just the good bits, the whole shebang, and then feeling really comfortable sitting in that uh, and practicing being that person in front of others until it feels really good to be yourself. I can imagine like, you know, it's, it's this di- deep dive into your psyche. It's got to help. It's got to impact confidence and, and overall just make you feel better about life, about you, about everything. Absolutely. Because you're starting to have an understanding of why things happen the way they did or why things happen going forward. And you have like new tools for your toolbox of self-awareness. Now, I, I, I would like to say too, because this is really important, every once in a while, you're going to find something out that is bigger than you can handle on your own. And so I always sort of have people ahead of time commit to seeing a therapist if anything comes up that feels too big for you to handle because like I'm not a therapist and I'm very clear about that this technique works really really well uh, for things that you can handle on your own but there are a lot of things that we can't handle on our own and that's when we need to have a professional um, mental health provider helping us through those kinds of difficulties so let's dive into your process a little bit more and one part of your process is it's a four point system or four part system. What is that? Tell me about that. Yeah. So, you know, I call myself a coach, but there's a lot of training involved as well. And so the four part system is based on my years of training as a, uh, in classical theater and 25, um, and more at this point years of performing on stage as an actor and a musician. And it's, it's the four essentials that you know when you get into a situation, if you're not sure what to do, if something comes up and you get thrown, you go back to one. And you know what to do because half the time, I mean, I could, you know, let's say I'm, you're my client, Raquel, and you're, you're giving a presentation at a conference and you're really nervous about it. And I coach you through it and we do everything. And you get up there and you freeze you don't know what to do, right? right? Your speech mm-hmm. is there and ready to go, but you don't know how to get out of this situation. And so that's why this is this is the basics. This is where we always go when we mess up, when we're in trouble, when we're not sure what to do, we go back to one. And one is standing. So the four are standing, breathing, speaking, and reading. And we always start with standing because we always want to start in our bodies because that's where all this is happening. Mm -hmm. And I use the principles of something called the Alexander Technique to teach you how to stand in a really supportive but open way that allows lots of energy to flow through your body so that you can be as um, passionate and as grounded as you need to be. So it, it lets you be all of the things you need to be and is a very supportive way of carrying your body. And it also supports step two, which is breathing. So I look at breathing in two parts. One is controlled breathing to stay calm. Mm -hmm. Controlled breathing is whenever you decide ahead of time when you're going to breathe in and when you're going to breathe out. It's as simple as that. When we do that, when we take away the job of our unconscious brain, which usually controls breathing, into our conscious brain, it sends a signal to our brain that we're not in danger and helps us come out of fight, flight, and freeze mode. And your brain stops spiking your bloodstream with adrenaline and cortisol, which are the stress hormones that cause so many of these things to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Hand shaking, knees shaking, voice shaking, voice raising in pitch, sweating, um, all of the different things that can happen to you when when you're nervous or stressed. And so it helps you stop that from happening. 
And we also uh, think about breathing in terms of supporting your voice, which is step three, speaking. So we focus on something called your optimum pitch, which is the most resonant sound that your body can make on any given day. And I add that last bit on any given day because our voices change daily based on what's happening in our lives, based on what we oh. ate, based on how much stress you're carrying in your body, based on your menstrual cycle. Our voices change uh, you know, with our cycles as well. Hormones can sort of uh, thin out your vocal cords and there's all kinds of things that can happen. So we learn how to create sound with our bodies and you know, there's like a pitch that on that given day is going to be the sound that vibrates the most, that feels really full and really rich. But we also have to remember that tomorrow that sound could be different because X amount of things could have happened. So we don't focus on the tone. We focus on the creation of the tone so we know how to get our body to create whatever is the best sound that's going to come out. And then finally, it's reading. And so reading uses all of the stuff that we've been uh, learning, you know, before that, all three of the steps, and they culminate in essentially how we communicate with folks. So I always recommend writing out your presentation word for word ahead of time. A oh, lot of wow. people like to use point form notes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people say bullet points. I know. And that's, that's where I differ. One of the ways that I differ from like say Toastmasters, who's really into uh, bullet points, point form notes. I feel like usually, like when you're really good at it, you can use point form notes. But that's like when you're like Obama, right? Like <laughs> <laughs> you do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us are not, uh, are not there. The reason is if you are a person who tends to get nervous or stressed out about speaking in front of people, one of the things that can happen to you is when you have a stress response, you're not able to access certain parts of your brain. And so like memory is impacted by that. Mm -hmm. So am I gonna throw you up onto a stage with point form notes when you can't even access certain words in your memory? That's not gonna serve you very well, right? Mm -hmm. So part of the reason, you know, part of the pushback from folks about using point form notes is, but uh, then I sound like a robot when I'm reading. So that's why we learn a technique so that we don't sound like a robot when we're reading. And that's uh, called text mapping. So text mapping is when you mark up your speech ahead of time using breath bars as the beginning place. When we put breath bars into mm -hmm. our speech, so that's like deciding ahead of time when we're going to breathe, we already know that when we practice controlled breathing, deciding ahead of time when we're going to breathe, it sends a signal to our brain that we're not in stress mode. And so I'm baking into your process a, a method to help you stay calm as you're reading to your audience. And it's so effective. And there's, there's like a ton more to it, obviously, but it's so effective that once people get used to it, they very rarely go back. That's like, you're going to go back to point form notes if you, you know, if you get told tomorrow that you have a presentation or something like that, where you just really don't have the time to flesh it out properly. But once you get really good at text mapping, it's reading all the way because you want to, you want to be able to create a really well fleshed out presentation as much as possible. And that includes being very careful about your words, being careful about where you're placing everything, um, using the exact best word to help describe what you're talking about. And those are the types of things that we don't necessarily get on the fly, right? Uh, I've also seen people waste their audience's time, like more often than not, when they've got point form notes and they go off on, on a tangent mm -hmm. and it's like, that's unnecessary. And now you've wasted five minutes of my time. So it's sort of, you know, it's respectful to the audience as well, I think, to be able to write it all out ahead of time, be really clear about what you're going to say and, uh, and be precise, not, not uh, taking up too much space. There's, sorry, taking up too much time because I want you to take up all the space. 
So I am going to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, but I do have a question for you then in regards to that, because I find this an interesting point. Um, and I, I have a background in um, journalism. So, you know, there's scripting with stories and things that we do. And I was always taught that, um, you know, the, the problem with writing everything out is then you try to memorize everything that you write. And if you don't have the teleprompter in front of you running through your script, you're, if, if you mess up, say, a word or something that you're saying, you're going to kind of get lost because you're not reciting it verbatim, is what they always taught me. So is that does that factor into this at all? Well, like I hear that, but what I have found, what actually works, is that when you're really, really clear with your script and when it is in fact memorized if there is a part that you get to that you can't quite remember you're more you're able to ad lib and then weave your way back to okay. where you where you wanted to be going that that you know it, it, it there's so many different different ways of approaching this and i the the thing people talk to me about the most is the writing out the speech like they're just like really resistant to it and there's <laughs> so much so many people who who advocate against it but i'm pretty strong and i've i've yet to feel as though um it would have been better for one of my clients to bring up point form notes because again they've got the technique and and you know a teleprompter is a little bit different than being able to bring your speech up with you to a podium right you're mm -hmm. not gonna you're not gonna lose the teleprompter Okay. No, that's, that's super interesting. I was just curious thoughts on that. No, uh, listen, it's, mm -hmm. it comes up all the time. It's so funny. So one of the other things that I saw on your website that you do is tarot cards. Yeah. Tell me, how does that factor into public speaking? I know. And this is what I mean by this is, it's like this eclectic group of tools that I use that, that end up being great for my clients. So I, I've always been interested in tarot and, um, would go in and out of it like very casually like hobby hobby sort of stuff uh for the last 25 years and then like probably about four years ago at this point i started to pull cards um well on different phases of the moon i like to follow the moon cycles because they remind me to think about where i'm at to think about what i want and to think about what i need to let go so traditionally on a full moon you're supposed to let go of what's no longer serving you right and that could even mean things like your netflix subscription or um you know that that frenemy that's like not that you're just like you need to let go of in your life mm -hmm. and then on the new moon you're supposed to think about what you want to bring into your life like what you want what your goals are things like that so i always liked the idea that something in nature that's just gonna happen regardless can remind me to be mindful of what I wanna leave behind and what I wanna bring forward. So I would pull tarot cards and I started to follow this woman, Jessica Dorr on Instagram and she had such an interesting way of interpreting the cards and she brought you know, her background of self-help and psychology and she was looking at them sort of uh, as archetypes and storylines. And that got me really interested. Like I said, I'm a musician. And so um, like poetry is really exciting to me. And so this weaving of storylines and archetypes just got me really interested. And so then I was, I was doing it on a bit more regularly. And then I was getting more and more interested in it sort of on the side of all of this other stuff I was doing. And then last, last year, I had started to sort of read for my friends and I realized that I really enjoyed it and I wanted to have something that was um, a lower price to offer to offer people and so I was like that sounds like a fun stocking stuffer to me right <laughs> so I offered them I offered readings and like they they sold out before I had a chance to even close it down so and then <laughs> people were into it so much that I, some clients would, would ask to do it. And I got interested in tarot and journaling and shadow work sort of as a concept as well. And so using, thinking about shadow work. So thinking about a question of like, what scares you the most in the world? Let's say that's a really broad question. Then you pull a card and you use sort of the inherent archetype of the card 
to springboard your journal answer. And so your response to the card made you think about the question. And then I turned that into a course because it was so impactful and people were finding it so helpful. And so now I have this course that it combines speaking, so public speaking tools, like what you learn the basic training, the four steps, mm-hmm. shadow work, and and how to read tarot cards. So like it, it, it actually teaches you um, the traditional ways of looking at the cards and then how to start building your own interpretations and how to use that as a tool. And so now as a small business owner, I've been reading tarot every day for probably the last two years and journaling every morning using, you know, the tarot cards that I pull as a way of introspection and really taking a look at myself. And it means that I'm in touch with myself constantly. I know what I should be working on. I know what's bothering me about myself. I know what's bothering me, you know, outside of myself. And I work through solutions and it's helping me grow internally, which is helping me grow as a business owner as well. It's so cool how it's all connected. I love that. And this actually kind of um, springboards me into my next question here. Um, Funny how the tarot conversation did that, but uh, we're talking about, you know, public speaking, but those skills that you develop in public speaking, they're, they're, they're useful, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, in so many other ways, right? Whether you're doing a, a marketing or a sales pitch like we do here at Red Shoes often, or, you know, just in a room at a mixer, you know, trying to network and meet people. So, um, you know, how can some of the skills that people learn for public speaking, how do they translate? Yes. And I just made a course on that, actually. <laughs> um, this this is this is the the best part I think about this training is that it translates into just about anything where we have to be with other people. So I can tell you that in my old job, I worked in a, a law school and sometimes profs would be really worked up and have a lot of big, uh, difficult energy. Mm-hmm. And there was one person in particular who would just start like start yelling at me from down the hall as she's coming forward, like not yelling at me, but she's yelling because she's down the hall and her energy is just so big and mm-hmm. difficult. And one day I said to myself, you know what to do? And I stood up. I was sitting and I stood up and I rolled, I call it rolling into Alexander. So that's the step one standing. And I literally just like brought myself up to standing in a really powerful position. And she just was like, what is happening right now? (laughs) It, It really helped diffuse her energy because she just realized that like it was, she wasn't just allowed to be this, you know, like you know, about to explode firecracker. And I thought to myself, holy, this is huge. This is really, really big. This idea that we are, that we just sort of uh, physically stop difficulty from coming at us by showing that we are grounded and strong. And I'm, can you repeat your question? Cause I got really lost in that memory. Yeah. Yep. We uh, we're talking about how the public speaking skills translate into all sorts of different things. So right there, that that was like, that was a great way of diffusing when people are coming at you. And you know, most of us in in different workplaces have had difficult conversations with folks or people who are coming at us with with really negative energy. That's a really great way to diffuse it. Uh, Work presentations, right? So you're not necessarily getting up and giving a speech, but you might have to present your quarterly numbers or um, talk about a bit of research that you've been doing. And so this is another opportunity for you to use the training to stand in order to breathe, to stay calm. And then you're going to be using a voice that's resonant, which means that um, other people will be more inclined to listen to it. And I just want to say as well, this is really important. The speaking bit is not about lowering your voice to be more palatable for other people. Because I want to be really clear on that because a lot of women come to me and say, I need to lower my pitch. And I say, for who? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, is that actually good for your voice? Does that, does your body support this, this choice? Or would it be better for you to speak in your natural tone and for other people to just um, have to deal with it? So, um, giving work presentations, job interviews, 
it's it's the same stuff as well and so you know i always advocate to think of the five questions you wish you would be asked that really help you shine and then think of the five questions that you are probably going to be asked and come up with paragraph or two answers for each of them and use the text mapping in order to prepare them uh that works out really well interpersonal relations you know like even i use this technique sometimes when i'm having an argument with my husband i'm like okay those never happen <laughs> <laughs> never <laughs> go back to alexander stand up right because i find when when the when the volume goes up i tend to shrink a little bit and uh when i realized i was doing that i was like okay nope get back up physically hold your space use your resonant voice breathing right? Mm -hmm. The controlled breathing to stay calm so that, you know, as long as one person stays calm, both people can stay calm, I find. Like not all, always, but it really does help. Mm -hmm. um, I use controlled breathing in all kinds of situations that I might be nervous, even, you know, like waiting in the gynecologist's office, just like <laughs> practicing controlled breathing so I don't start, you know, getting, uh, getting a little ahead of myself in terms of um, anxiety. Yeah. So it's just, there's like, it, it's all over the place. And uh, family dinners where, you know, somebody says something horrific and uh, you can't leave that, you know, like not, not countered. So it gives you, you know, it gives you the, the tools in order to extend your bravery and um, say what needs to be said. So... This is so interesting. And I love how you, you laid out all these scenarios too, because I feel like, you know, we all deal with that all the time. If, you know, our listeners out there today, you know, one key takeaway that they could take away from our conversation today, what would be the biggest thing you want women to hear? I think, you know, that bit that I talked about before where what you feel like, you feel like you're the problem. You're the one making up the situation in your head. You're imagining things. Uh, you know, we've been gaslit for years to believe that it's always our fault. It's not your fault. Your intuition is your best tool. And we have been, you know, socialized to ignore that for years from folks who, you know, didn't want, uh, didn't want us to, didn't want what we were saying to be true, basically. And so, Spending some time recalibrating your intuition and trusting yourself is probably going to be the best first step for you in terms of starting to feel more comfortable and more confident in all situations, right? This is half, you know, I don't hardly ever coach people on actual speeches. It ends up being, um, which I love to do, but it ends up mostly being about people finding it difficult to get up in front of a group and and usually at work and uh, present information and uh, your feelings are valid your intuition is right and just keep calibrating that so that uh, and recognize that you've been conditioned to not trust yourself yeah yeah that's so I mean your whole approach I just find fascinating I love that it's different um, and I love how it is so focused on women. I mean, women have this, in, you know, we always talk about the sixth sense and women being so in tune with their intuition. So I just, I love that that's the method that you take. If anybody else is like me and excited about what you're talking about here today, how can they get a hold of you, learn more? If they want some coaching, how do they find you? Yeah. Okay. So my website is www.ubuskills.com and it's the letters UBU. And I'm really active on Instagram. So that's at UBU skills. That's where I tend to um, talk about what I do. I, I really try hard to be myself so that folks who are interested in working with me can go and see what I'm like, what I'm all about and be like, that's a hell yes. Or oh no, that's, this is not going to be the good fit for me. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and that way I also get to work with people who I know we're going to have, um, a good connection. So those are the two places I'm on Twitter and Facebook as well. Again, UBU skills, but those are the places where I spend, um, I spend a good deal of my time. And I, my email address is Megan at UBU skills.com. And I'm always happy to answer questions, um, or set up a chat so that we can talk about, how to work together. 
Perfect. I'm going to include the Instagram link, the website link, and your email below in the show notes here so people can find you, get in touch with you if they want to do that. And Megan, I mean, I can't say thank you enough for being here today and sharing what you shared with us and and just some of these skills that I think really can help women because we all have those, like you said, those work presentations or those, those situations where we just need to be able to speak and be more confident. So this was fantastic. Thank you, Raquel. I am always happy for opportunities to talk about this. I nerd out on this so hard. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you for listening. And if you want to hear more Soul Source, just subscribe to our show. We're available wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can watch us too. We're on YouTube. Just look for Soul Source. Soul Source is brought to you by Red Shoes Inc., a leading agency specializing in crisis and strategic communications, media relations, social media, and so much more. To learn more about Soul Source and Red Shoes, visit us at redshoesinc.com.